but I'm Ovi. I'm one of the stroke fellows. I, I was a neurology resident here. I finished last year, so now I'm a stroke fellow. I'm here with my co-fellow, Abby, who will do the second part of the presentation. Um, we're going to be sort of talking about uh, stroke, um, but mostly geared towards what you need to know as an internal medicine resident. Um, just always remember that, you know, here at Duke, there is, you know, separate neurology and stroke services that manage a lot of this stuff. But then when you go out in the real world, there's a lot of hospitals where the medicine person or the hospitalist is the one taking care of stroke patients. So it's things that you guys need to know, and you're always welcome to come rotate with us in neurology or on stroke as well. Um, so, you know, we're splitting it into two parts. I want to do the part one, which is acute stroke and stroke codes. Then Abby will talk a little bit about stroke workup and management. Um, so part one, acute stroke. And remember that these, this part, acute stroke, especially for people with acute occlusions, is all about time. We know for uh, about every minute or two that uh, an occlusion persists, people lose about two million brain cells. And so when we have acute interventions that are possible, we want to push them as quickly as possible for these patients. That's why the stroke code was invented, and that's what you need to remember when, when thinking about uh, acute treatment for strokes. <clears throat> um, so this is sort of taken from up to date, sort of general goals about acute stroke man management. Uh, you want to try to minimize brain injury, treat medical complications, and try to determine the etiology. Those are your general goals uh, when someone is coming in. So minimizing brain injury consists of our acute interventions, things like TPA and thrombectomy that I'm going to talk about in detail. There are a lot of medical complications, infections, other types of clots, that um, aspirations that, that can happen that you really want to be vigilant about or take care of. That's why we have a stroke service and a stroke team. And then it sort of shifts into determining the etiology so that we can try to prevent patients from having future strokes. Because once you have a stroke, you're at an increased risk in recurrent strokes. And so uh, in the initial assessment for patients, uh, UpToDate sort of recommends uh, these objective findings. Everything always starts with ABCs. You know, if your patient is decompensating, if they're losing the pressure, becoming hypoxic, you know, trying to prevent the stroke and prevent disability doesn't matter if your patient is going to die. So that's always your first focus if you're concerned about acute stroke in any setting. Um, we obviously want the history for these patients, but the one thing we want more than anything else, and I'll say this multiple times during my talk, is the last known normal. So anytime you have a concern, you want to call a stroke code, or you're concerned about a patient having an acute stroke, know when they were last normal and what their baseline was. We can do everything from there because we can do a neuro exam to see what the difference is right now compared to their baseline. We just need to know when they're last normal because everything is really timing based. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the stroke scale, which is what, how we examine uh, these patients, uh, determine uh, what they're eligible for and, and how severe their stroke is. And these are some of the objective tests that we do um, in the acute setting. So we always do a glucose because hypo and hyperglycemia can mimic acute uh, symptoms of acute ischemia. Um, we can do labs, you don't need it before TPA, but there are a lot of things that can mimic it, for example, if they have infections or whatnot. CTs and CTAs are sort of the mainstay of our acute imaging, and then a lot of times we include a cardiac workup because acute sort of coronary or cardiac issues can contribute to acute cerebrovascular ischemia. Okay, stroke codes. Uh, I know that this is sort of the main thing that a lot of the medicine res residents ask me about. We have one working on stroke right now, Chelsea, who's asked me to sort of talk a little bit about stroke codes and see when you when you would call one, why you would call one, and what exactly is contained within a stroke code. If you ever want to see them, you're always welcome to come on the neurology consult service and the stroke service and see a stroke code in action. Um, but the key thing to remember is the purpose of a stroke code. It's really to decide if the patient is a candidate for TPA or thrombectomy. You know, I always quiz the medical students when they're on what the purpose of a stroke code is, and three out of four always say to try to figure out if the patient's having a stroke. And that's not necessarily true. If you want to know if they're having a stroke, you can just order an MRI um, or something like that to, to be able to, to get the diagnosis. The reason we have stroke codes for rapid assessment is because our therapies, TPA and thrombectomy, are time dependent in terms of they produce better outcomes the quicker we're able to deliver those therapies. Um, uh, TPA being, uh, being the first one, and we'll talk about the criteria, and then, and then thrombectomy as well. And so we always move quick whenever either of these are possible. So if you, have, if you think your patient's having a stroke, but they're not a candidate for either of these, then there's not really reason to call a stroke code. You really just need to move on to the sort of stroke workup and management part. Um, so this is sort of the process for a stroke code that I've, that I've written out. Um, and to me, it's always a four-step process, starting with ABCs always. You want to make sure that your patient is stable enough to be able to run a stroke code in the beginning if they need to be intubated, if they need pressors or anything like that, uh, which does happen once in a while, um, particularly more the intubations because their blood pressures are usually high in the acute setting um, from sort of the brain trying to reperfuse itself or hyperperfuse itself. But we do have a lot of cases where we need to intubate the patient before we can proceed with a stroke code. 
And then um, the next step is always is try to determine if the patient is a candidate for TPA. That requires a history and exam. Um, so you're, for, uh, currently for us, it's, uh, it would be an acute um, neurological change within 4.5 hours. So that your last normal has to be within 4.5 hours and it has to be a focal neurological change as in one side of the body is worse than the other or something like that, or acute onset of aphasia or, some, or posterior circulation symptoms. Our exam that we do is the stroke scale. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, we usually do a CT brain without contrast and we're trying to really figure out reasons to not give TPA when you do a CT brain. So that can be a hemorrhage, that can be a really malignant stroke that's already developed on a CT scan, or if you see something like a tumor on the CT scan, that'd be another reason not to give TPA because you have an alternate etiology for your symptoms. Some of the objective things you need, you need a blood glucose. It's the only lab you need prior to giving TPA. Blood pressure, um, you have to give TPA, your blood pressure has to be less than uh, 185 over 110. And so if the patient comes in and their systolics are in the 190s, you have to give some medication to lower their blood pressure before starting TPA. Um, you do need a patient weight because it's based off of its weight. Uh, I mean, the dosing is based off of the weight, 0 0.9 milligrams per kilogram. And you need IV access. And then patient consent is something that's a little bit controversial. Some people believe it's the standard of care and should just be given. But we at least talk to and get consent from our patients that we can get consent from. If they can talk, you know, this is a medication that, com that comes with a significant risk um, of, of bleeding. Uh, so you, I like to sort of discuss it with the patients and make sure they're on board when we're given the medication. But you have to do it quickly because you don't want to waste too much time in the acute process. After you've made a decision about TPA, whether or not you gave it or not, then you sort of move on to deciding about thrombectomy. We'll talk a little bit about the indications and contraindications. Um, but the way, you, you know, for thrombectomy, you need a large vessel occlusion. So we do vascular imaging, typically a CTA, because it's the fastest one that we can do. And we're looking for proximal occlusions in the M1 or at least distal M2 or something in the internal carotid artery or the posterior circulation like the basilar. And then for interventions with thrombectomy, you definitely need patient consent. You need a formal patient consent done in order to be able to proceed. And then after that's done, typically in a stroke code, we decide where the patient needs to go. Um, sometimes it's the stroke service, sometimes the neuro ICU if they need closer monitoring or if they need a blood pressure drip and then any acute, rec you know, final recommendations, blood pressure goals, do they need an MRI? What do they need in terms of their stroke workup? So this is the stroke scale. If, you, if any of you guys call a stroke code and you're able to deliver or, or tell the neuro resident what an actual stroke scale is for that patient, we will bow down before you. We're very impressed when off-service people are able to do a stroke scale. And there's a lot of apps that can help you actually do the test so that you can get a score. It ranges between zero and 42, but it's almost impossible to get 42 because you need to like, for example, have ataxia, which is impossible if you have no motor strength in any of your arms. So that's a positive finding. Um, but we use an app, a lot of the neuro residents called Neuro Toolkit. I think it costs a couple of dollars now. Back uh, in the Stone Age when I was starting neuro residency, it was definitely for free. Um, but you can go through the different parts of the, of the scale and, and put in points for the different parts of your exam to, to report a stroke scale. There is an MD calc as well where you could calculate a stroke scale. But you can see it starts with a couple of evaluations for mental status. Can they follow commands? Can they answer orientation questions? Then you assess their cranial nerves. Is the, do they have deviation of their eyes to one side or the, or the other? Do they have a hemianopsia? Can they see? Is, do they have facial droop, facial droop or not? And then uh, motor strength. So we have them raise a limb at a time and see in 10 seconds, does the arm drift, which is one point? Does it hit the bed, which is two points? Is there no anti-gravity, but it moves, which is three points? Or do, is there no movement at all, which is four points? Uh, ataxia on finger to nose and heel to shin gives you a couple points. Then we do a sensory exam. We test aphasia by having them name objects, like my watch, my thumb, glasses, but you can also get a book from the AHA that has a bunch of objects for them to name. Um, and then dysarthria, we have them repeat uh, difficult phrases like today is a sunny day in Durham or red, white, and blue or say buttercup three times um, and then extinction. So after your sensory exam, you want to touch them on both sides as well and say which side do you feel it on. And some people might feel it on the left, feel it on the right, but then if they have a right MCA stroke, when you touch them on both sides, they ignore that left side of their body because they have sensory extinction to double stimulation. So that gets you points on the stroke scale as well. So TPA, I talked about a couple of these indications. You have to be over 18. That's at least the formal recommendation, but we've done it on children before if we feel like it's an acute stroke worth treating. Last on normal, less than 4.5 hours. There are some newer trials that have suggested for people um, that wake up with stroke symptoms. We usually say their last on normal is the night before when they went to bed. 
But if you do certain types of imaging, like an MRI scan and there's diffusion restriction, but no flare signal abnormality, they could be a candidate for stroke or for TPA. Uh, but really what you need to remember is last time normal less than 4.5 hours. It has to be acute focal neurological deficit. I talked about the dose. Uh, one of the new trials on the block also was the PRISMS trial, which was super helpful because it made the argument uh, that the, the deficit that the patient has has to be functionally disabling for them to benefit from TPA. They did a trial of TPA versus high dose aspirin for non-disabling strokes, and there wasn't really a difference. Uh, those are the objective measures that were needed that I mentioned earlier. And there is a long list of contraindications, but a lot of it makes sense. It's either you have a propensity for bleeding or had like recent surgery or trauma that makes you at risk for bleeding, or you have a bleeding condition, or you're on a blood thinner, or you have something that you wouldn't want to bleed, like a brain mass inside of your brain or an aortic arch, arch dissection. So these are some of the things that we look at. We ask the patient as much as we can. We usually focus on whether or not they are on blood thinning medications or their blood is thin. Um, and so these, and you know, if they have low platelets, they're, they're actively having GI bleeding. Um, these are some things we look for. And if you find any of these, then we, we do not give TPA. So this is the original article from 1995 uh, from the NINDS um, that showed the, the first positive trial for TPA before, that kicked it all off. Um, and this is where we cite a lot of our numbers for, from when we're explaining the benefits of TPA to patients. Um, for patients that, and the average stroke scale for this population was about 10 or 11. Um, and for patients that didn't get TPA, they had about a 26% chance of being independent at three months and patients with TPA had about a 39% chance. So it improved by 13% or about 1.5 times as better as much. Um, and this bleed risk was 6%, but there was no difference in mortality or end outcome for those patients that bled. So those are the numbers that we cite um, when trying to get consent for a patient for TPA. So these are some of the CT scans. You might see the one on the left, um, the hyper density is a hemorrhage. So that would be a reason not to give TPA. The one on the right is a right MCA hypo density. Um, you can see a pretty big MCA stroke there. So that would be what we call a malignant infarct with a little bit of midline shift. And for us, that is too much stroke to give TPA. The more stroke that's developed, the higher the risk for hemorrhagic conversion because you have breakdown of the blood brain barrier. Um, so we're hesitant to give TPA in those situations. And those um, and CTs like that were excluded from most of the trials for that reason. Thrombectomy is usually the next step. So these are some of the indications. You have to have a pretty good uh, pre-morbid MRS, age over 18. Your stroke scale that we talked about earlier has to be over uh, five, so six or greater. And the last one normal has gotten pushed out to 24 hours. So in zero to six hours, usually you just need a CT, CTA. If there's a large vessel occlusion, not very much stroke on the CT scan, you can do your thrombectomy. If it's between six and 24 hours, there were two studies done, Dawn and Diffuse 3, um, that showed that with perfusion imaging, you can tell how much of the brain is dead, how much of a number there is, and you can use that information to determine um, if the patient is a candidate or eligible for a thrombectomy. Um, and right now, we still give TPA before proceeding to thrombectomy for patients, but that's something that's under investigation. Um, so this is the Hermes collaboration um, that summarized the five major trials that, that initially showed the benefit of thrombectomy. Uh, they're listed at the top right, Mr. Clean, Escape, Ravascat, Swift Prime, and Extend IA. Um, altogether, it was like 1,200 patients, and they figured out that the, the number needed to treat to get improvement in someone's disability status was 2.6. So the, the results were really impressive. It was physically significant. and really changed the way that we manage acute stroke triage. So this is a picture of a large vessel occlusion. Uh, you can see the right M1 where the arrows are. There's sort of a cutoff, and you can compare it to the other side. And that is the type of occlusion we're looking for to proceed with thrombectomy. Some of the blood pressure goals, if there's no intervention, like no TPA or thrombectomy, you want to keep them up to 220 because you want to hyperperfuse the brain. Uh, for if there's TPA, you want to keep them less than 185. And if there's thrombectomy, then usually we actually do less than 140 if they got good reperfusion. But if they didn't get good reperfusion, then we liberalize it quite a bit. This is a stroke on um, an MRI. You can see the diffusion restriction on the left which is the hyperdensity on DWI with a correlating hypodensity or darkness on the ADC map. Um, the ADC map stays dark for about seven days and it takes about 12 hours for that flare signal abnormality that you see as well. Uh, some of the stroke metrics, if you ever have a stroke patient and they're not a candidate for acute therapy, they've been here for a couple days and it's just a stroke, 
These are really the things that you have to do. And you can always Google joint commission stroke metrics. And so you need to make sure that they're on VT prophylaxis, they're getting their therapy. We're decided on what, what their antiplatelet plan is. We're looking for atrial fibrillation and that we looked at their lipid situation and decided on a statin medication. And you always have to educate stroke patients. Um, just a brief slide about intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, there hasn't been a study done yet that shows anything we do for intracerebral hemorrhage benefits them. So surgery, the STITCH trial was negative, the NISTI-3 trial was negative, reversing platelets, the PATCH trial was negative, but we still do some of these things. Um, in particular, we'll drop the blood pressure to less than 140 or 160, which is patient dependent. We try not to box their kidneys in the process. Um, and other than that, it's really just supportive care. But there are some people, if they have big hemorrhages, we'll evacuate them. But if you have a concern for hemorrhage and they're not a candidate for anything else, um, I think it's important to remember that stroke codes are really for patients that need TPA or thrombectomy. They don't have to be done for a patient with intracerebral hemorrhage. But if you're ever concerned about a patient, you can always go ahead and call it, and we're, we're definitely here to help. And I'm just, I included the ICH score here, which is a measurement of what their mortality is likely to be in 30 days. And you can calculate it based off their GCS, age, location, ICH volume, and whether or not they have blood in their ventricles. So this last slide I added on at the very end last night, probably at like midnight when I was a couple of drinks in, just to sort of summarize um, what exactly you need to know in terms of a medicine doctor about when you need to call a stroke code and when you should not call a stroke code. Because uh, there's a lot you can get into in terms of the details and things like that. And you guys don't need to really memorize or, or, or be all the nitty gritty. So I think these are really the, the most important or salient points in acute stroke management. So when should I call a stroke code? The correct answer is when the patient is a candidate for TPA or mechanical thrombectomy, depending on the results of the CT or CTA. Now, if you can't remember the criteria for TPA or mechanical thrombectomy, then I think a good summary sentence is any acute, focal, non-minor neuro change with the last known normal under 24 hours. Non-minor because you, know, you need a, a functional disabling deficit for TPA and you need a stroke scale at least six for thrombectomy. Um, and then anything the last normal over 24 hours, we aren't really gonna do. And then just a list of kind of the reasons not to call a stroke code, things to think about before initiating it, although you can always, and I put this at the bottom, if you're ever concerned, there's a neuro change, you're not totally sure about the details or whatnot, you can always call us, that's the pager, a number for neurology, and you can call a stroke code if needed. But if we come and one of these situations, or one of these facts is accurate, we're, we're probably not gonna take the stroke code too seriously. So if the last on normal is unknown or over 24 hours, if there are medical problems causing altered mental status or delirium, we get a lot of those from the ICU, not the MICU, but the other ICUs. Generalized weakness, if it's non-focal, if it's sort of the same on the left or right, we don't get particularly excited. And if it's a minor neurological change, numbness, just facial droop, just dysarthria, without any motor weakness, without any aphasia, without any gaze deviation or, or visual loss. Those are typically things that where they're not candidates for acute intervention. So you could just maybe stat pages or, or request a neuro console instead of actually calling the stroke code in those types of situations. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I'm gonna turn it over to Abby now and let her finish on stroke workup and management. Thanks, Obi. Hey guys, so um, like you mentioned, my name is Abby, I also did residency here. Um, and I'm gonna try and briefly wrap up our talk and uh, touch um, a little bit on the workup and the management that we do once the acute phase is over. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about stroke classifications and why we care about that, and then go through uh, the risk factor modification we try to address both in the hospital and also in the clinic, and then kind of again summarize it and let you know what we think of our salient points for you guys to know. So this is primarily based on the uh, 2019 update to the 2018 guidelines that were published uh, for the management of acute ischemic stroke specifically. So I'm really not going to talk too much about ICH here. So you guys probably know by now um, that we admit pretty much anybody that we're concerned has had an acute ischemic stroke. That is typically because there is a risk for recurrent ischemic stroke in the first few weeks of about three to five percent. So that's um, significant for our patients. So we feel the need to bring them in and make sure that secondary prevention measures are in place to try to prevent as many of those as we can. We really get an MRI on everybody. Um, that is even and I would also say, even if we can see it on CT, we tend to get the MRI anyways. Um, that can vary center to center sometimes, but the reasons that we tend to do it is because you often can't see smaller strokes that may happen concurrently. You wanna make sure to see the extent of the disease burden that's present on MRI. And really, um, it can help you determine the etiology of the stroke. 
in addition, um, we, like Ovi mentioned, we'll get vessel imaging on pretty much everybody. That's often done by the time we get to the secondary prevention measures. Uh, you know, the CTA is often done, but if it is not for whatever reason, you can decide between CTA and MRA. Um, a lot of the reasons for doing those are non-neurologic. In other words, if you're concerned for their kidney function or they have a contrast allergy. In general, we think CTA is a better picture. Um, if you're sending them for MRA anyways, you can send them for MRA. A little side note about that, the MRI head is done without contrast, but in order to get a good study of the neck, um, you need it with contrast. They can do what's called a time of flight in both, um, so without contrast, but it tends to not be a very good study. You can also get an ultrasound of just the carotids. We'll talk about a little bit why you may want to do that, but in general, we like to assess the intracranial vessels as well. Um, LDL, A1C are important for us. Everyone's going to get a TTE and everyone's going to leave with a cardiac monitor. Um, the every patient part of again joint commission um, stroke metrics that every patient is at least evaluated for therapy now you may not place a consult for the therapist if the patient's at baseline for some reason in other words like they had a TIA and that kind of thing but we have to at least document that you know that they were evaluated by the team every patient's going to get a dysphagia screen it may be a nursing dysphagia screen if they have no facial droop with dysarthria and um, if they have either of those things they need a speech therapist dysphagia screen like Ovi mentioned, again, we're going to um, talk a little bit more about progressive hypertension, but it's something that we allow in all of our patients if they have not gotten uh, any intervention. It's going to be up to 220 over 110, for at least for the first 24 hours, but uh, 24 to 72 hours is typically a good window. We're going to uh, address their antithrombotic needs and then discuss that in therapy as well. Um, so I wanted to touch base a bit about stroke etiologies and some of the TOAST classification is what um, they termed it in a lot of research studies, but you know, you want to determine if you think that this is due to a large artery atherosclerosis. Uh, and that's going to typically be if in the area of infarct, you have a vessel that is either occluded or stenosed. If it's not, if you may find stenosis or occlusion in other vessels, but if it's not in the right distribution, then it's not considered due to large artery atherosclerosis. Cardioembolic is another important etiology um, that really and truly you can only fit them into that category if they have confirmed evidence of AFib or confirmed evidence of a clot somewhere, LV thrombus, that kind of thing. There are patterns, again, on MRI that could be highly suggestive of a cardioembolic etiology, but unless you find that source, it, technically you can't fit it under that category. Small vessel disease is another term for basically a lacunar infarct. So if you find a clinical sign of a lacunar syndrome, and by that I mean like pure sensory, pure motor, that kind of thing, there's other ones, but again, probably not that important for you guys to know. And that, and along with your MRI evidence is often um, what is going to determine whether or not it's small vessel disease. And then other determined basically is just if there is some other cause that you can identify, pregnancy, malignancy, some other hypercoagulable state. Undetermined is basically just you've determined that there are more than one cause it could be due to. Um, there's a negative evaluation or an incomplete evaluation. And that's important because that's going to really direct, again, which risk factors you focus on. Probably going to evaluate for all the risk factors regardless of the classification, honestly. Uh, but nonetheless, it does help us focus. And so these are just kind of some examples. Um, you know, on the left-hand side of the screen, you're going to have a large um, MCA infarct and with the concurrent CTA um, you see right at the bifurcation of the common carotid, a lot of uh, disease burden there. You can see the calcification on the CTA. That's a very common place for occlusion or stenosis to develop, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But if you see something like this, you're gonna probably presume that it may be due, or they may be linked. This is a good example of cardioembolic. Here you have multiple um, vascular territories, um, and they all look to be timed about the same time. So you can presume, I mean, these are anterior and posterior. So you can presume there's probably some sort of cardiac or central source. And this is a good example of a small vessel disease. And this is, um, you know, a right thalamic infarct. This may cause something like a pure sensory symptom. Um, and so the small vessel disease and the atherosclerotic disease, we're going to be focusing a lot more on their antiplatelet therapy, their antihypertensives, their um, statins, and then 
cardioembolic, we're really going to be focusing on seeing if we can make sure that we can't find AFib or that LV thrombus, that kind of thing. So it just, like I said, helps to direct therapy. But like I mentioned already, we do look at all the risk factors and we try to address each of them. The non-modifiables are good to keep in mind just because, um, you know, we take them into account when we're discussing um, recurrent stroke risk with our patients. We also, you know, some of the risk factor scoring takes these things into account, but obviously we're not gonna be able to do too much about it. Um, so talking about hypertension, it's considered one of the most important, if not the most important treatable risk factor across all strokes, because it is a risk factor for all strokes. And whether or not you're talking ischemic or um, hemorrhagic, it, it affects both. So you know, we keep talking about this initial uh, permissive hypertension and the 24 to 72 hours, it's a guideline. Uh, it's really difficult actually to pin it down. It's not well studied because it varies a lot from patient to patient. Anecdotally, or I guess I should say expert opinion wise, um, if you have a critical stenosis or your patient has proven to be pressure dependent, you're gonna let them go for longer. And what do I mean by pressure dependent? Well, for instance, last week on the stroke service, we had a 98 year old female who came in with, um, you know, a mild, well, she had stuttering symptoms initially, but by the time she got upstairs, she had a mild right facial droop and um, a slight dysarthria, but she was pretty much back at baseline. Her worst that the symptoms had been, she'd been pretty dysarthric with the right arm weakness, but like I said, she was doing pretty well. Her pressures were in the 200s consistently though. And at about maybe 18 hours, the decision was made to um, start her on half dose of her home core egg. She'd been on 12.5, so she was put on 6.25 BID did a wonderful job of bringing her down to about the 160s. Oh, I should mention she had been consistently in the 200s. Um, but by the next morning, I think she'd gotten her third dose and she was in the 110s and she had a significant facial droop. She was pretty flaccid on that right side. So she was given fluids, put in Trendelenburg, her uh, pressures popped back up to the 160s. Her um, Exam improved, so she was very much somebody who was pressure dependent. Unfortunately for her, she, I, we think, basically completed her infarct and went on to, in the next several hours, um, go back to being placid on that side with significant dysarthria. And whether or not, so that that is thought to be due to something, a, a uh, concept with basically that most strokes have an ischemic core with an at-risk penumbra around it. Um, that's typically perfused by collaterals, and that's actually the mainstay of thought behind why things like TPA and thrombectomy work. That being said, um, you know, whether or not her penumbra would have gone on to become ischemic anyways, it's hard to know, but that is a classic example of a pressure-dependent um, exam that you want to be very delicate with. So we basically discharged her not on any of her antithrombotic therapies um, with plans on how to get her to her goal eventually, which the goal for all of our patients for secondary prevention is less than 140 over 90. There are some trials that have looked at less than 130 over 90 that some suggest that maybe um, in patients specifically with diabetes and other risk factors, that may be a better goal, but it's kind of debatable. So we just kind of go with the less than 140 over 90. And there's really no data as to which, if there's a better agent. Um, smoking, I'm gonna briefly just say that it increases the risk for all stroke subtypes and that after um, at least five years out, their stroke risk declines as if they're never smokers. Um, diabetes t increases the risk of stroke by doubling it. Um, A1C less than seven tends to be the goal. These, those, that tends to be something that we, you know, leave for PCPs and that kind of thing to address, but it is the recommendation. For dyslipidemia, this one's a little bit interesting. So it's, it is, tied to increased risk for large vessel atherosclerosis and lacunar infarcts, but it is inversely related to hemorrhagic strokes. So we do shoot for a goal less than 70. There was a Sparkle trial that showed that using a torvastatin 80 doesn't decrease the risk of acute or recurrent ischemic strokes. Um, so we do try to aim for that goal. Um, I had a longer spiel about this, but I really don't have time to go into it. Suffice to say that physical activity um, and some of our stroke trials have been shown to be the single most important intervention to reduce the risk of acute ischemic stroke. Now, obviously, I've already said that once, right? So clearly, these, these trials kind of um, contra or they don't always all show the same thing, I should say. In the Sampras trial specifically, where that was shown, they had lifestyle coaches. So how applicable it is to real life, probably not, but it is important 
Um, so atrial fibrillation is something that we care a lot about. <laughs> it is associated with more severe acute ischemic strokes as well as these longer TIAs, and that's thought to be due to larger clots, and that's specifically in um, relation to or in contrast to, I guess I should say, um, atherosclerotic carotid, carotid disease. But the risk of recurrent acute ischemic stroke in non-anticoagulated patients is up to 12% per year based on their other risk factors. So it's, it is significant. Um, so that's why we discharge all of our patients on about a 30-day event monitor. If we have a high risk, like let's say that image that I showed at the beginning um, with all of those various infarcts, if somebody like that had a negative evaluation, we probably would refer them for an implantable monitor because the um, suspicion for atrial fibrillation uh, would be very, very high. Interestingly, and probably a little bit outside of the scope of this talk, there have several trials that looked at trying to just empirically place those people on, on anticoagulation and those have been negative. So we don't do that, but we look very um, diligently for a reason to put them on anticoagulation. And typically that's with the DOAX and it does look like it reduces the risk of stroke by about two thirds, uh, regardless of what their baseline risk is. I put a picture of the CHADS VASC up there. Most of you probably have seen this or are familiar with it. I will be honest and say we don't use it all that much. And that's because um, by the time patients hit a risk or a score of two, the recommendation is for anticoagulation. Well, having a stroke or a TAA puts you at a two. So all of our patients qualify for it. But if you have a patient with AFib and you're not sure whether or not um, to put them on anticoagulation, it is helpful. Oh, and the uh, last thing about this is that, um, you know, uh, Patients who bleed that on anticoagulation, that always becomes very tricky, and that would be a reason to, um, you know, refer to vascular neurology or get a second opinion or get some help with that, because it, be, it can be difficult. But I will tell you that we frequently have patients come in, not frequently, but when we get patients that come in with intracranial hemorrhages um, who have atrial fibrillation, we do still want them back on their uh, anticoagulations eventually, but it's going to, you know, be a provider to provider decision as to how exactly based on the size of the stroke and that kind of thing. Um, carotid atherosclerosis uh, is an important modifiable risk factor as well. So the lesions are thought to be to account for about 10 to 12 percent of acute ischemic stroke. Now these are going to probably be smaller strokes than for instance your um, atrial fibrillation strokes, uh, but nonetheless important. So um, cervical segment disease is what's going to be modifiable specifically because that's something that they can't intervene on and so that that's okay or that's helpful to know that the typical lesion is in the cervical segment because it does tend to occur at the bifurcation of the internal and external carotid who exactly you refer does change so men tend to benefit from this more than women so the actual the recommendation is if it's symptomatic so on the same side of the stroke 50 to 99 percent uh, degree stenosis is a reason to refer them for carotid endarterectomy or stinting. Um, females, it's uh, 70 to 99 percent, and they do not reopen already occluded carotids. So, and this is along with optimal medical management. I could talk for a, long, a while about antiplatelet management. There's been a lot about this in recent years. Suffice to say that if you have of symptomatic intracranial stenosis. So again, in the distribution of your stroke, there was a positive trial that essentially showed that dual antiplatelet therapy for 90 days reduced the risk of recurrent stroke um, with the number needed to treat of 11.5, which is actually pretty good for secondary prevention. Um, for high risk TIAs or small ischemic strokes, this is the most recent change in our dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, it's basically dual antiplatelet for 21 days. Um, and the, just the high risk um, is high risk TIA is determined by the ABCD2 score. Again, that's there. Again, I don't have time to go into it. I apologize. But this um, is basically to exclude any of those really large strokes that have a high risk of bleeding. So this is sort of the summary of what I would want you guys to be able to take away in terms of um, secondary prevention. We do lean heavily on our patients' primary care providers to help us achieve these goals. We follow our patients in the stroke clinic and try to help guide this stuff, but we don't um, direct, for instance, diabetes management and things like that. And so um, we very much appreciate your help with all of this. And um, I think that's everything. Please let us know if you have any questions, but I know we're right at one o'clock. So that's all. Oh, guys, awesome. Thanks, guys.